Hello everyone, I hope all of you are doing great and staying safe. On behalf of Biopetro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy and SPE Egypt section, I would like to welcome you to our second interesting webinar about machine learning fundamentals and introduction to Python. This course consists of four webinars, four quizzes and the final exam. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Selma Rashidi. I'm a petroleum engineer. I owned my bachelor's degree from the American University of Ras al Khaimah and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our lecture today will be delivered by a very special and knowledgeable guest. Mr. Has Biliade is a senior data scientist and engineer at Vine Oil and Gas. He's the founder and CEO of Observe Intelligence, focused on providing artificial intelligence and house training and solutions. He served as a faculty member at multiple universities, including West Virginia University, Marietta College, and St. Francis University where he taught data analytics, natural gas engineering, enhanced oil recovery, and hydraulic fracture stimulation design. Mr. Biliade has over 10 years of experience working in various conventional and unconventional reservoirs across the world. He has worked on various machine learning projects and held short courses across various universities, organizations, and the Department of Energy. He is the primary author of Hydraulic Fracturing and Unconventional Reservoirs, first and second editions. He is the author of Machine Learning Guide for Oil and Gas Using Python. He has authored and co-authored several SPE papers. He holds his bachelor's and master's degrees, both in petroleum and natural gas engineering from West Virginia University. So basically, he's a living legend. So please make the most out of, the, out of this lecture. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to drop them in the Q&A box. Mr. Biliade, we are so honored to have you today, and the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Salma. I appreciate that. Um, and thanks to uh, Pio Petro and, and everybody, uh, including uh, Dr. Ahmed, who, who has organized this uh, really good uh, webinars for students across the world. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Last lecture, we talked about uh, all the fundamentals of uh, machine learning, we talked about the workflows. And, and before we get started, just one more time, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, the Observe Intelligence podcast, uh, please do so. These are just educational free podcasts that are on YouTube, uh, where I invite different uh, professors, uh, and also different executives, and ask them uh, about their vision of data science and artificial intelligence within the oil and gas industry. And all the materials that we'll be covering in this course are coming will be coming from this book here, uh, if you, in case you haven't noticed. And with that being said, last time we talked about cloud computing um, and, and basically data centers. If you recall, we talked about uh, different types of data centers. We talked about the traditional data centers, you know, like centers, the on-prem data centers, um, and also the uh, cloud data centers that a lot of the uh, major organizations such as Amazon and Microsoft provide. Um, so, so if you remember, just a quick overview of that is that um, cloud computing uh, revolves around large centralized servers stored in data centers. And, 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 and these data basically um, are processed and, and then travels to the central processing center. Um, so, so one thing that I want to mention is that you can actually go, for example, on, on Amazon um, and actually have a uh, free access to uh, free cloud computing. They have different tiers and one of the tiers is actually free. It doesn't al allow you to have a lot of storage and a lot of CPUs, but it, it is free if you want to get kind of hands on, you can, you can actually try that. Now, for you guys starting out, you can use your just, we're gonna talk about installing Python and how, how, like how you can go through that process, but you can actually use um, you know, your um, desktop to, to, to run different codes because you, you're probably not dealing with huge amounts of data. Uh, once we go into you know, a large amount of data, then I think that's when you need to start actually um, you know, using cloud computing uh, to help you fasten the process. But if you're gonna, you know, use uh, a few spreadsheets that have, I don't know, 200,000 rows, 100,000 rows, your desktop can most likely manage that, you know, and you don't need to go to cloud computing route. But if you're gonna do like seismic interpretation and, you know, terabytes of data or, or, or gigabytes of data, then 
that's I think when, when cloud computing can really help you fasten the process. So um, we talked about cloud computing. Uh, now let's talk about edge computing. So as I said, cloud are, are basically like, these are the data centers that different companies have such as Amazon, AWS is a, is a famous uh, cloud provider by Amazon. Azure is a famous cloud provider by Microsoft. Uh, uh, so aside from cloud computing, there's another term these days called edge computing, okay? Edge computing. Now, what is edge computing? So let's first talk about what edge is and what the, um, the, the uh, reasoning behind using edge would be, okay? So edge basically are small computers. Think as edge are, as small computers, usually, you know, like this size. And basically these edge computing or these edge computers uh, or, or these edge devices uh, are designed for harsh environment, okay? They're designed for harsh environments. And especially in the oil and gas field where you go out and, and place these edge devices, um, you know, it's, it's in, like a lot of places are super cold or super hot. So these edge computers are designed uh, for harsh environments. And the ones that are not designed for harsh environments are actually encapsulated into a box. So they will be protected. Uh, but that's what an edge computers are. They're basically small computers that are designed for harsh environment that are used to um, uh, data. Uh, it, it, is, it is used for real-time data processing. And what it does, it, it allows for machine learning models to be deployed on those edge devices, okay? So if you recall last time, we talked about supervised machine learning model, you know, unsupervised model. We talked about reinforcement learning model, right? Um, so these models, let's just say you develop these models and you're interested in deploying some of these models real time. Well, how do you do that? Well, to deploy these, these, these models real time, you need to actually couple that model with an edge device in order to deploy real time. And that's when the um, advantage of these, of, of, of these edge devices come in. So you can actually deploy these machine learning models um, uh, and, and, and couple them with an edge device. And basically um, uh, the advantage of the, these, these edge devices is that they, they'll, they make real time decisions for you. Uh, so as opposed to waiting a few days to make, to make decision, you can make real time decisions and autonomize the whole field. And you know, that these are the advantages of, some of the advantages of, of, of edge devices. So as you can see, this is critical for technologies such as, such as real-time applications, allows for efficient data processing and large amounts of uh, uh, data can be processed um, and reducing internet bandwidth, you know, and then it eliminates costs and ensures that applications can be used effectively in remote locations such as oil and gas sites. And as I said, these edge devices are, are great for remote locations, you know, because they're specifically designed for, for harsh environments. Um, so, um, so basically, again, these are the same stuff that we talked about. Just remember the difference between, you know, the, the cloud computing and the edge computing that, you know, uh, there, are, there are two different things and the terminologies, you know, that are used are, are, not, are, are not the same thing. So just remember that edge devices are installed on site, okay? And these are just mini computers or small computers that are designed for harsh environment. And you can deploy your machine learning models on those, on those edge devices for real-time decision-making. If, if that's, if, if, if all you can take from edge devices, that's all I want you to take from it. Just these are, you can deploy your machine learning models on those edge devices for real-time decision-making to create value. And that's the value proposition of edge devices. And as we go, you know, uh, into um, like there, there are a lot of companies, including Dell, like for example, that produces these edge devices in large amounts. You know, uh, as as uh, the, the use of edge devices become more common, the cost, of course, is going to go down. So, so in the next, I think, few years, you're going to see a lot more uh, momentum from from edge devices in the oil and gas industry for for uh, autonomous and 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 automation, basically. So the next slide that I want to talk about, as you can, as you guys can see, you know, we talked about artificial intelligence. You know, we said this is basically using uh, machine intelligence as opposed to human intelligence, right? This is artificial intelligence, um, or they call it AI, right? And then we talked about machine learning. We said it's a subset of AI. You know, as you can see here, 
you got the artificial intelligence, and you got machine learning, which is a subset of AI. And we talked about what, what machine learning was and, and how, you know, uh, what the use of machine learnings are and some of the techniques, the different techniques, different types. We talked about some of the algorithms under each type, if you recall, and some of the basic workflow that we talked about, right? That was machine learning. And then there's another term called deep learning. If you guys haven't heard that before, uh, you, you hear that term a lot. So if you listen to, for example, um, a lot of the executives from major tech companies, you know, if you, if you listen to Eric Schmidt from, from Google, you know, uh, he always talks about deep learning, how powerful it is. Um, if, you, if you listen to, you know, um, uh, different executives from Amazon or, or Facebook, they always talk about uh, deep learning. And, and, and so, so what is deep learning? And, and, you know, in this class, we're not going to go too much too deep into deep learning, but just understand that deep learning is basically a form of uh, neural network. Okay. It's a form of neural network. And basically what, what, what um, deep learning does, as you'll see in a minute, in a neural network, you have one hidden layer. In deep learning, you could have multiple hidden layers. Okay. So you have more than one hidden layer. Uh, and, and, and basically, there are different types of algorithms uh, under deep learning, such as a recurrent neural network. Uh, this is one form of deep learning algorithm, uh, which is very uh, sophisticated and very powerful. Uh, it is used for time series analysis. We talked about that. There's another type called convolutional neural network. Those are also very powerful for image processing for text processing, you know, and for size, especially for seismic data processing, uh, convolutional neural networks are also very powerful. So if you remember anything from the slide, remember the artificial intelligence, you got AI, you got machine learning under AI, and you got deep learning under machine learning or deep learning is under, you know, artificial neural network. And basically it just means that you have a neural network with uh, multiple hidden layers and, and, and um, and it's very powerful in extracting data. Uh, so now the next slide is, why is um, uh, you know, uh, deep learning or, or, or in general, uh, neural networks have become very um, powerful or very common? You know, this is nothing, neural networks have been around for decades. They're, they're nothing new, you know, it's, it's not like it was invented a couple of years ago. So why all of a sudden, you know, uh, deep learning has become, or neural network with combinations of deep learning um, have become very uh, powerful and very famous all of a sudden. Well, the reason for that is one is big data. We, we now have, you know, large data sets. We have easier um, data collection storage techniques, right? Uh, we, have, we have big data. And when you have a lot of data, these deep learning algorithms become so powerful when you have a lot of data. Uh, so, so now that we are starting to track and store and, and have a lot of data, these deep learning algorithms really become very powerful. So, so big data is number one. Hardware, we have, we have GPUs now, uh, uh, graphics processing units, you know, your, your computers probably have CPUs. Uh, GPUs now is, is the next generation uh, of, of, of uh, computing. And you can see that um, you can use your, um, you can actually um, get a computer that has GPU uh, and basically run your uh, codes based on that. And, and actually um, you can, you can uh, when you install these deep learning packages, such as, such as, such as TensorFlow and, and, and Keras, you can actually um, use, um, uh, you can actually run those packages with your GPU of your computer as well. So, so with, with, with the advancements in hardware such as GPU, it really allows for, uh, for, for deep learning you know, um, um, applications within different industries. And also the last one that I wanted to talk about is software. Now you can see TensorFlow. If you look at, look at TensorFlow is a powerful package uh, provided, you know, you can actually download these packages um, in, like in Python uh, or, or, or uh, in, in your, um, you know, Anaconda, in, like your, your Anaconda doesn't come with, with TensorFlow, but you can install that on top of that, and, and it actually, uh, you can use this to run deep learning models very easily. So, so you have all these uh, softwares that have been generated now to run these deep learning algorithms, which are very powerful. So that's why 
uh, in, in the past, you know, a uh, few years um, um, or in the past, I would say five years, deep learning has, has gained a lot of momentum uh, just because, you know, we have big data now, we have the hardware and we have the software. Okay. So now let's talk about artificial neural networks. So to understand deep learning, we have to first understand what artificial neural network is. And we're going to go over actually a little bit heavy on math today and talk about what AI, what, what uh, ANN does and, and, and go through the steps. It's actually, a, once, you, once we go through the math, you see how easy it is actually. You know, they, they've, they've made it sound very complicated, but it's not. So I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to explain what AI, what ANN is, is first and then go over the math step by step so you can understand what exactly and ANN does, and and this is going to be the whole lecture today. And this is so important. ANN is one of the main um, algorithms used in, in 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 machine learning. And also on top of using ANN, um, uh, all the deep learning algorithms, such as the convolutional, the the um, uh, recurrent neural network, all of those, you know, you have you have you have to first understand the fundamental building blocks of of, of a perceptron of of a neural network before you go into the deep learning algorithms, okay? So what is ANN? As you guys know, human brains have billions of neurons, okay? It has billions of neurons and, and um, it's very complex. Uh, our brain is very, very complex. And in my mind, uh, when, I, when I think about, you know, some of the, um, uh, the, the, the complexity of the neural network of human brain, I always think about how hard it is to um, uh, to, to how, how hard the psychology of people is, right? Because, you know, every, uh, you know, uh, neural network is different, right? And there are billions of neurons. And, and, and so it just goes to show that uh, how, how complex and how powerful humans are in general uh, with, with this, with, with this ANN or artificial neural network that we have, okay? So the idea uh, from ANN came from the neurons of the brain, okay? Uh, it tries to mimic um, the human um, uh, artificial neural network, okay? So there are different types of the, there are, so each uh, artificial neural network consists of an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And we're gonna talk about each one, an input layer, hidden layer, and an output layer. Okay, and then the number of um, neurons uh, in the output layers, or um, also, also the, the the number of neurons in the hidden layer, is a function of how complex the problem is. So the more complex the problem is, the more neurons you are most likely going to need. Okay, so if you're solving a pretty easy problem, um, you're not going to need many neurons in your hidden layer. But if you're solving a pretty complex problem, then in those cases, you're gonna need a lot of neurons. And in some cases, you might need multiple hidden layers. You, know, you might need more than one hidden layers, uh, which is then you go into deep learning, right? So as I said, when your data becomes so immense uh, and, and, and extracting information from that data becomes very difficult, you're gonna need a lot of, um, you're gonna, you might need a lot of neurons and also multiple hidden layers to tackle that problem. Um, so, so with that, let's just look at this example here. Let's look at, here's your input layer here. You have your, for example, um, your input features like gas in place in this case, uh, sand per cluster, water per cluster, number of perfs, stage spacing, cluster spacing, and so on and so forth, right? These are your input, this is your input layer. And then you have your, you have one hidden layer here, this is just one hidden layer, okay? And then you have an output, you know, uh, it's a regression output, it's a regression model because your output is EUR, is estimated ultimate recovery per thousand feet. Essentially, it, it tells you how much the well um, uh, produces over its entire lifetime, right? It's your EUR per thousand feet, per thousand feet of lateral length. And as you can see here, uh, there is a cost function here. Uh, this cost function is simply uh, the average differences between your actual values and your, your your actual values and your predicted values. So if you take the, the the average differences between your actual minus predicted values, 
that's the loss function that you're trying to really minimize in an artificial neural network. And we're going to go into this, the, these calculations a little, a little bit more deeper, like deeper in a minute. Okay. So just, just remember that in an A and N right now, you have an input layer, you have a hidden layer and you have an output layer and your output la layer in this case has just uh, one, one output, which is EUR per, per thousand feet, but you could have uh, multiple, uh, you could have multiple outputs. Okay. So now let's talk about, here we go. Let's, let's go actually go over the fundamental building blocks of a neural network. So let's look at this and make sense out of this first. So first you have your X1, X2, and XM. These are your input, uh, basically your input uh, features, right? Like sand per, you know, sand per foot, uh, water per foot, or let's just say cluster spacing and so on and so forth. And there is a weight associated with each um, input feature. So you have W1, W2, let's just say WM, okay? And then what you do is, so you take each input feature times a weight, okay, times a weight, and then you sum it up, you sum it up. Then you also add a bias. A bias is basically this W0. This W0 is basically your bias. And what it is, it allows your activation function to move to the left or right. And by the way, bear with me. I haven't even defined activation function yet, but just bear with me for one second. So you have your X1, X2, XM. You have weight one, weight two, and weight M, right? And then you sum it up. You add a bias. Then what do you do? Then you apply a nonlinear a non activation function, okay? And we're going to talk about different types of activation functions, different types of nonlinear activation functions. And then that's it. And then you get your output. So your, your Y hat is your output. This is your, this, this symbol here is your nonlinearity or your nonlinear activation function. This is your summation. And then these are your weights and this is your inputs. That, this, is the, this is the basic form of a neural net network. And I, I, and I haven't even added the, uh, the hidden layer yet. But when you add a hidden layer, it just adds, it's just, you know, the, the, the process continues the same exact way, you know. So let's just look at the inputs. You got the weights, summation, nonlinearity, and output. So if you, if you take anything from this slide right here or from this whole lecture about A and N, is that what ANN does? It takes each input features, multiplies it by a weight, okay, uh, and then it sums it up, okay. This 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 summation here. Then it adds a bias, okay. This bias allows your activation function to, to move to the right right or left, okay. And then it and then take the um, um, uh, activation function of 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 of, like of this whole 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 term basically. And that is basically the fundamental building blocks of a neural network. So this is it, guys. I mean, this is really it, how simple actually it is. It's not that complicated. Your weight, your inputs times your weights, sum it up, nonlinearity, output. This is the fundamental building block of a neural network. And to understand, you know, other types of other forms of neural networks and other uh, uh, deep learning and other stuff, we first have to understand this, this basic concept here. So very important. Just remember, you got to take your inputs, times your weights, sum it up, uh, add a bias, apply a nonlinearity, and then you get your output. So now let's go to the next slide. So again, the next slide is the same thing. What we're doing here is, you again, you have your, uh, you have your inputs, times your weights, then you sum it up, you add a bias, you take the activation function of, of this whole term. Now let's rewrite this using more exotic term, using linear algebra, okay? Let's, let's rewrite this in this form. And this is, this is the form that you might, you might see in a lot of the books, in a lot of the uh, places that you, that, that, that you go to. So basically G is, your, is a nonlinearity, is your nonlinear activation function, which is here. W0 is your bias, which is here, plus instead of the summation of Xi times Wi, what I did was 
I just converted this to a vectorized form, you know, so I have X, capital X, and then I have the capital W. And capital X is simply X1 through XM. And then uh, capital W is, is basically your, your, your uh, vectors, uh, the, uh, W1 through, through WM, okay? So this is the form that you see in a lot of these, um, um, in a lot of the textbooks. Um, and if you, if you read an article online, this is probably the form that you're gonna see. But simply, it, it, this, this, this form here is just, it's just a linear algebra version of what I showed you here, basically. Okay, it's the same exact thing. So now what is this nonlinearity? We talked about this nonlinear activation function. And what is it used for? As you guys know, nonlinearities allow us to approximate arbitrarily complex functions. Okay, that's what nonlinearity allows. Just, just look at this picture, look at this X and Y. And if, if you're trying to capture this nonlinearity, this data, uh, if you, uh, you know, you cannot capture this data with just a linear function. So that's what a nonlinear activation function does. It captures nonlinearity uh, in, in complex uh, functions. And this is just one simple example of what that means, okay? So now just remember that, you know, in, an, in a simplified version of perceptron, by the way, um, uh, neural network is also ref referred to as multi, uh, as, as MLP, multi -lay layer, per, you know, perceptron or, or, or like a, a, a neuron is simply a perceptron, okay? Uh, so don't get confused with the terminologies here, okay? So as we said, you know, to simplify this, 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 this whole thing, you can see that you have your um, inputs, okay? You multiply it by the weights, you sum it up, you add a bias term, you apply a nonlinearity, and you get your output, okay? So this is basically a, a uh, simplified version of a, uh, fund this is a fundamental building blocks of a neural network. So now let's talk about when you add a hidden layer, okay? When you add a hidden layer, what happens? And I think the best way to go through this is to go through an example on, on how this is actually done. So I have, a, I, have, I have one simple example that goes through step-by-step step on exactly how you do it. So you train a model, as soon as you train a neural network model, what happens is it's gonna give you uh, all the weights and all the uh, biases, okay, for that neural network model. So assuming that we have trained a model now, okay, let's go over the calculations here. So here's, here's, here's the example. So the example says an ANN classification model with five input features and one hidden layer that includes 11 hidden neurons have been trained with high accuracy. The resulting weights and biases have been summarized for each feature and neuron. Apply this trained model to the input matrix provided. Use the logistic function, which by the way, we'll talk about this is logistic function is an activation function that we haven't talked about yet, but we'll talk about after the slide here. For transformation and classify the result less than 0.5 as good, and more than 0.5 as bad since logistic functions fall between zero and one. So here's a table that I have. So I have parameter A through parameters E. E is an echo, okay? As I said, uh, in this case, uh, the um, uh, structure of this neural network has only 11 neurons, has only 11 neurons. As I said, you know, the more complex the problem is, the more neurons you're gonna use. The less complex the problem is, the less neurons you're gonna use. But in this case, you know, I said, let's just use 11 neurons just for this example. So I have neuron one through neuron 11, okay? I also have uh, parameters A through E, and each parameter has an associated weight for each neuron. So parameter A, has a weight of 7.54 for neuron one, okay? Parameter A has a weight of minus 2.36 for neuron two, okay? Parameter C has a weight of minus 16.96 for neuron five, okay? And then, so you can see that each single parameter 
and each single neuron has a weight associated with them, okay? Now let's talk about bias. So this is the bias term. As I said, the bias term allows the activation function to move to the, re uh, to, to the uh, left or right, right? That was the whole point of the bias. So from your trained machine learning, artificial neural network machine learning model, you also get a bias associated with each neuron, okay? Associated with each neuron right here. So neuron one has a bias of 1.86. Neuron five has a bias of minus 0.29. Neuron 11 has a bias of uh, 6.38. As I said, this is just an example with just five parameters. You could have a hundred input features. You could go A through, 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 through hundred features, or you could have, you know, uh, thousands or, 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 or hundreds of thousands or billions of neurons as far as my concern. But, you, you know, as the number of neurons increases, the complexity also increases and the time it takes to run these models also increases. And by the way, if you have too many, if you have too many neurons, your model might just get overfitted, you know, and we'll talk about overfitting and underfitting in a minute. Okay. So these are basically provided to you, right? This is provided to you. Now let's go and look at the, so remember that you have an input layer. In this case, you also have a hidden layer with 11 neurons, and then you have your output, right? In addition to the first set of weights, you also get the second set of weights, which are, um, you know, 10.83 uh, uh, minus 12.33 and so on and so forth. You also get your last bias, which is 1.24. These are all from the uh, your trained neural network machine learning model. And then uh, these are your input features. You have your you have, you have parameter A through parameter E. Parameter A, um, um, uh, you know, so, so you're trying to evaluate what happens, you know, to this set of features. You're trying to predict what happens when you feed the model, when you feed the model a new data point. And the new data points are 78, 90 for parameter A, 94 for parameter B, zero for parameter C, 0 0.006 for parameter D, and minus 0 0.09771 for parameter E. So you're trying to evaluate what happens uh, when you feed the model these new set of features uh, in terms of your, in terms of your uh, prediction. Is it gonna be uh, good or is it gonna be bad? In this case, it is, it is a classification problem. And you can see here, you have parameters A through parameters E, and uh, these are the min and max feature of each parameter. So the, 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 the min is 64, 47. The max is 13, 8, 27. The min is 10. The max is 104, the min is for parameter C is zero and 4.12 and so on and so forth. So why do I have this min and max provided here? If you recall from my last lecture, what I said was we first have to normalize, you know, these parameters. You know, when you feed in all your features into a neural network model, you first have to normalize your features to be on the same scale, to be between zero and one, okay? So the first step that I have to do is I have to normalize this, this input parameters uh, to be between a, a scale of zero and one. So the first step is, here's the first step. So I take uh, each feature, 7890, which is com comes from here, 7890, 7890 minus, minus the min, which is 6447 of parameter eight, divided by max minus min, which is 13,827 minus 6447. Here we go. So X minus min of X divided by max of X minus min of X for each parameter. So parameter A normalization. Now I've converted this to a scale between zero and one. So it's a point 0.1955. Same thing for parameter B. I'm gonna take 94, which is the input parameter that is given to me, 94 minus 10 divided by 104 minus 10. So if you remember 10 and 104 came from here, it's your max and it's your min. 
So I'm gonna just normalize each feature individually. Okay, that's the first step that I gotta do. Uh, because this problem, when it was provided to me, it did not include the normalization. So I have to first normalize the feature to be on the same scale between zero and one, and then move on. Okay, so I did the same exact thing for parameter A, B, C, D, and E. That's step one, loud and clear, right? So step two now. So step two is, is the matrix, if you remember, is the matrix multiplication of the normalized input parameters from step one, right? Um, uh, by bias and weights of each neuron. So uh, let's just think about uh, these, these numbers here. You see this 0 0.1955? This came from here. 0 0.1955, 0 0.8936, 0, 0, and 0 0.046. 0 0.1955, 0 0.8936, 0, 0, and 0 0.046. So these are my input features. And if you remember, I said you multiply your input features by your weights. Your weights, remember that? Your, 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 um, X, your X1 through XM times your W1 through WM. So you multiply that by the weights right here. So the 7.54, where did that come from? Let's go back to the input uh, problem. Here we go. 7.54 minus 1.83 minus 9.59. These are the weights of your neurons of neuron one. Okay, so here we go. Minus 1.83, minus 9.59, and so on and so forth. So, and this this term here is, is your basically your uh, your bias, um, uh, you know, one, 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 one and 1.86, you know, so, uh, so if, if you do that matrix multiplication, it's just one times this, plus 0.1955 times 7.54, uh, you just do the simple math here, and then you get a value of 2.22. So now you got to do the same exact matrix multiplication between your input features and your weights for each one of the neurons. This was for neuron one, by the way. For neuron one, you got 2.22. Do the same thing for neuron two, you get minus 0.27. Do the same thing for all the neurons, and you get 6.09. You can do this. You can either code this in, in Python or uh, actually you don't even have to code this in Python. If, if you feed Python your new set of features that you want to evaluate, it will spit out the result for you. But I'm trying to make you understand how Python does it or, or how any other uh, programming languages go, goes through the process of step-by-step -step calculations. Okay. So this was step two. So step one was normalization. We normalize the features to be between a scale of zero and one. Step two is a matrix multiplication of what? Matrix multiplication of your input features times your weights, okay? Now, step three, you apply a non-linear activation function. That is your non-linearity, a non-linear activation function. So if you remember, in the previous step, the neuron, um, uh, the, the, the matrix multiplication, uh, to turn out to be 2.22 2 for neuron one, right? So 2.22. So a Zygmunt activation function basically says one divided by one plus exponential to minus X. And this X is simply your minus 2.22. That is your zygmoidal activation function. That is your logistic activation function, which we'll cover right after this example is finished. So you can see here one divided by one plus E to negative 2.22 and you get 0 0.9019. And you do the same exact thing for each neuron. So you apply the zygmoidal function or the logistic function for neuron two, you get 0 0.4321. For neuron uh, three, you get 0 0.5403 and so on and so forth. So remember step one, normalization, step two, matrix multiplication of inputs and your weights and, and then you and then you sum and, and then add a bias and sum it up and that's right here then step three is applying a a, a logistic function applying a non-linear activation function 
to that term, which we discussed, right? And here's that. Now, step four, now we have to take um, the outputs, which are, if you can see, see 0 0.9019, 0 0.9019, and multiply it by the um, uh, second set of weights. So if you remember, the 10.83 came from here. See this, 10.83. 10.83 came from the second set of weights, which are basically after your hidden layer, right? This is the, uh, this is the, um, uh, you know, this is right before you feed into the hidden layer and you go into the output, right? So you have to take, uh, and you have to do a matrix multiplication uh, between these, these second set of weights and what came out of uh, this step three here. So you take 0 0.9019, 0.9019 times 10.83 plus 0 0.4321, 0 0.4321 times the second set of uh, weight for the second neuron. And you do the same exact thing until you get minus 3.5439. So that is step four, which is the matrix multiplication of uh, the last bias and the second set of weights. And then as you, as, as, as you might have guessed, the next step is to apply a logistic function to that. So when you apply a logistic function, which is one over one plus exponential, negative 3.5439, which came from this guy right here, then you get 0 0.02808. So since 0 0.02808 is less than 0.5, the classification for this input set of data would be good. So, so this is how basically uh, you can predict when you train a model, when you train a neural network model, you can then predict what happens uh, when you receive a new set of features, what happens to, to those, uh, to the prediction of that set of features. So you can see here in this case, since the answer was less than 0.5, it, it, it turned out it was classified as good. If it was more than 0.5, it would have been classified as bad in this case. So just an overview of this example. This example basically showed us that each neuron has a particular set of weights, okay? Each parameter in each neuron has a particular set of weights. And also it has the bias. In addition to this, if you have one hidden layer in your network, you also have you know, the last biased and the second set of weights here. These are essentially received from your ANN model. And then the first step that we did was we have to normalize the features between zero and one because the input features that were provided to us were not normalized. These were the original forms. So we normalize the features first, then we took uh, the input features, which were the normalized features here, and multiply them by the, um, uh, the first set of weights. You know, if you remember your XI times your W or your X1 through XI times your uh, W1 through WI, right? And then you applied a uh, logistic nonlinear activation function to each one of the neurons, and here are the results. Then you did a matrix multiplication of uh, the resulting, the resulting uh, answers from step three to the um, uh, to the um, uh, second set of uh, uh, weights. You did the matrix multiplication again, and you got negative three point five four. And the last step is to apply one more time the logistic function or the nonlinear activation function to that uh, minus 3.54, and you got this answer here. So this is an example of how you can actually predict once you train your uh, machine learning model, once you train your neural network machine learning model. So we talked about the activation functions. There are different types of activation functions. And these are some of the most commonly used ones that you can see here. You have the, uh, the identity activation function, which is simply f of x is equal to x. 
you have your logistic activation function, which we just covered in the, in the previous example. It's just f of x is equal one divided by one plus exponential to negative x, to negative x. And this is the logistic function that we used in the previous example. And it's a pretty well-known activation function that, um, that a lot of the uh, problems use to solve, okay? So this is one sort of, sum of, one, one sort of uh, activation function. And another type of activation function is tan H. It's simply your um, tangent hyperbolic activation function. And then it's, you also have your arc tan, your uh, in inverse of tan um, activation function and binary step, which is another type of activation function. So there are different activation functions. And so you might be saying, Haas, which one do I use? You know, there are so many activation functions. I don't even know you know, why you chose logistic activation function versus tan H activation function, right? So that's, if you recall, in, in the last lecture, I talked in, one, one of the students asked about um, how do we um, optimize these hyperparameters? And the answer was grid search. If you remember, grid search optimization is a process where you run different um, combinations of different fine tuning parameters uh, to see which one results in the best accuracy. So for example, if I'm trying to optimize which activation function to use, well, I would have to run logistic activation function with different set, set of neurons, different set of you know, solvers, different set of learning rates, different set of momentums and so on and so forth to see which activation function results in the highest testing accuracy. Uh, so, so what you can do is you can run a grid search optimization, which is essentially a nested for loop that goes through logistic activation function, tan H, arc tan, identity. It goes through different activation functions and run those activation functions with different um, um, hyperparameters to see which activation function results in the highest accuracy. So in, 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 in short, you can actually find the best activation function for your problem um, um, based on running different iterations of those hyperparameters, okay? So that's, that's how you find the best activation function for your problem, okay? So this is how you get your activation function. Now we talked about uh, loss optimization, right? We talked about in a neural network, um, you're, you're trying the objective function is to minimize your loss function, right? Is to minimize your loss function. Well, and we talked about that loss function is simply the average between your actual values minus your predicted values, right? You're trying to minimize that. So how does that work? Let's look at this picture here. So let's so on this axis here, you have your loss function with respect to couple of weights, weight zero and weight one. Here's your weight zero and weight one. The objective function is to try to, um, you, you're trying to go from this, this, this top of the, let's just assume this top of the mountain. You're trying to go from top of a mountain to the bottom of the mountain, okay? To go from top of a mountain, imagine you're blindfolded and you don't see anything, okay? You're gonna take one step at a time, either a small step or big step, right? And the size of the step, you know, varies, right? If, if you're more brave, you can take a big step, but if you take a big step, then what happens? Then you might miss on on some of the other steps. If you take two of a small step, it might take a long time to get to the bottom of the mountain, right? So the idea behind um, a gradient descent is that you start from top of a mountain, and you take the gradient, okay, uh, and, 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 then, and then based on that gradient, you slowly try to find your way to the bottom of the mountain, okay? So that's what gradient descent is. So the objective in neural network model is trying to finding the weights, the network weights that results in the lowest loss. So let's actually go back to this slide right here. This slide right here. So let's just say 
I have my sand, sand per cluster. I have my water per cluster. I have my number of perfs. I have my stage spacing. I'm going to feed into the model with these set of weights. I'm going to get, for example, an EUR. The predicted EUR is, let's just say, 1.5 BCF per 1,000 feet. However, my actual EUR is 1 BCF per 1,000 feet. So my predicted is 1.5. My actual is only 1, right? So there's a 0.5 BCF difference. What does this do? What is this, uh, what, what, what is this neural network is going to do then? Well, this neural network is going to back propagate, back propagate, and change the weights of these uh, neurons. You know, the weights that I just showed you, you got to change the weights of these neurons, okay? And then spit out the output again. Now, the output could be, let's just say, 1.2. Well, that's closer now. Your, your actual was 1.5. Your predictor is 1.2. Now that's a 0.3 BCF per 1,000 foot difference. It's going to back propagate again to, these, to this hidden layer. Back propagate by changing the weights of your neural network. And then spit out the result again. Now your result is 1.4. And the predicted was 1.5. Now it's a 0.1 BCF per thousand foot difference, much closer, right? So it's gonna keep iterating, keep doing this process until this loss function that I just showed you is minimized. Remember this loss function is nothing complicated. This loss function is simply the difference between your actual minus predicted, just the average of, of those. So if your actual was one BCF, your predicted is 1.5 BCF, that difference is what? It's 0.5 BCF. And for the, for, for the second set of test set, if your actual is 1.2 and your predicted is 1.3, that difference is 0 0.1 BCF, right? And then continue on and then take the average that is basically your, your loss function. That's basically your, you're trying to minimize this loss function. So when the model in neural network, you're going from input to your hidden to your output, right? It's a feed forward model, feed forward model. It feeds forward all the way into your output layer. Okay. So now in back propagation, that's where the complexity comes in. In back propagation, it back propagates into your previous layers. So it back propagates from output layer to hidden and to your input, changes the weights, and then it spits out a new um, um, uh, answer. And then it compares the new answer with the actual value. Is it getting closer or is, is it getting like, like further apart? Then it continues on with these iterations. It continues on and on and on until this loss function is minimized, until it gets to a point that as you keep adding, as you keep changing the weights, this loss function does not, uh, it does not drastically um, uh, get decreased. It, 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 it decreases slightly. It doesn't have that much impact. Okay. So at that point, you're good. At that point, life is good. You've uh, selected the optimum set of weights for all your neurons and you can continue on. So remember, if somebody asks you feed forward propagation is just, it goes from your input layer to your hidden and to your output. It's a feed forward neural network. Back propagation is when you go back and change, change the weights of these neurons that we talked about, and then spits out the result, compares it with the actual, and, and, and it keeps going on the process until the process is finished. Okay, so now let's go back to the gradient descent that I was talking about. So remember this loss, so this, this JW0 and, JW, and, and, and W1 is your loss function, okay? And then this is your uh, simply your weight zero and weight one. So now let's look at the steps in a gradient descent. In a gradient descent, you initialize the weights randomly. You randomly initialize the weights. Like here, for example, again, I'm going to start going from the top of the mountain to the bottom of a mountain. Okay, I'm going to initialize the weights, for example, right here. Or you could go right here or any, any, anywhere that you want to, right? And then 
loop until converge to a local minimum. So what happens is now what you do is you calculate you the, the gradient. And the gradient of what? You calculate the gradient of your loss function with respect to weights. So if you remember from this picture here, you're calculating the gradient of the loss function with respect to W0 and W1. These are your two set of weights that you have here. If you have more than two set of weights, you calculate your loss function with respect to all of your weights, right? That's what a gradient descent does. So you compute the gradient. If you don't re remember what gradient is, I'm sure you guys have passed the calculus course. You go back to the, 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 like the fundamentals of gradients and how, how it works. Um, so you basically take a step in the opposite direction of gradient, you know, which is, uh, which is essentially going down, right? So you're, you're taking a step in the opposite direction of the gradient here. You're going down. And then what happens? Then you update the weights, right? You calculate the gradient. Then you update the weights. And then, and then this, this uh, eta here, this eta parameter here, this is called your learning rate. Your learning rate is basically the size of the step that you're taking. So if you go from, from here to here, uh, it's just basically called your eta or your learning rate. It's the size of the step. If you take small size, it might take a long time for your model to converge. If you take big steps, big step sizes, or if you assume big learning rate, it might jump over some of the important information you, that, you, that you might miss. So you want to optimize that learning rate as well. And again, optimizing the learning rate comes from what? It comes from the grid search optimization, okay? It comes from the grid search optimization. And actually in Python, um, uh, you can also assign an adaptive learning rate as opposed to a fixed learning rate you can assign an adaptive learning rate where the model uh, changes those step sizes over time as a function of the number of iterations in your neural network. So that's how uh, this, this, this learning rate actually works. And then you change, you update the weights until your, un, until your loss function is uh, minimized, right? Until this, this gradient here, remember this gradient of loss function with respect to weights until uh, this, this, this whole term is minimized. Then once, once, once your loss function is minimized, then that's your, that's your, that's your, uh, that, that's your answer. You might be asking Haas, how do you calculate the gradient in back propagation? Well, that comes from chain rule, chain rule in calculus. You can calculate your gradient in, in, in back propagation. Okay. So I hope this makes sense. I know it we went through a lot of math, but remember that, you know, if you, if you want to understand, for example, go to deep learning, understand that, you first have to, have to understand a simple neural network. You first have to understand the fundamentals of, 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 of neural network prior to going into, into uh, a, a, a back propagation type of, or a, prior going into deep learning type of algorithms, okay? So that's why I, would, I really wanted to hone in and go in more depth as far as what is exactly happening behind the scene. That way, when you start using Python, when you start applying these models, you know exactly what's what, which parameters to fine tune, which parameters to work on, and so on and so forth. So, so now, remember that learning rate determines how fast the weights coefficients um, um, are, are basically updated. Learning rate varies from zero to one. And if the learning rate is too high, as I said, the algorithm might miss out on important steps and fail to converge. If it's too low, it might take too long to reach its destination, which is minimizing the loss function, or also they call it the cost function. It's the same thing, the loss function or the cost function. So with that being said, I'm gonna stop right here. Uh, this was basically what I wanted to cover today. I wanted to cover uh, the edge computing and also go into you know, the, the steps behind um, the neural network and how it works uh, and go through the calculations on that. I hope this makes sense. Uh, you might have to watch this video a couple of times if you didn't get it for the first time. And I, and, and I, and I, and I can assure you that, that after watching a couple of times, you're going to start to understand the process and the calculations behind neural net networks. But just if one thing that I want to say that I want to mention to remember is just remember this slide here. You have your inputs. You have your weights. You sum it up. You add a bias. 
you apply a nonlinearity activation function, which we talked about. You have logistic activation function, 10H, and all those activation functions. And then you get your Y hat, which is your output. So with that being said, I'll take any questions that you guys have. So, uh, Hoss, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So, so uh, what is the requirement to to be um, uh, to uh, to be an expert in artificial intelligence, and you can make money out of it? What what should be? Am I must be engineer or you no? Know, uh, what kind of a speciality? If I want to take it as a business. Okay, as a business, I, I think one thing that I would say is you first have to have some type of passion for it, right? If you don't have any passion for, you know, um, statistical analysis and, and dealing with numbers and looking at data, you know, uh, then, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not for you, right? But if you're passionate about it, if you're truly passionate about it, like the reason I do this, you know, because I love what I do, um, uh, I would first hone in on the fundamentals first. First, learn the fundamentals of what is happening behind the scene. You know, it's super easy now to go on, for example, on, um, on um, you know, Python and just apply, you know, load in different libraries and basically uh, apply different, uh, you know, machine learning like algorithms within Python. It's super easy now, like, like nowadays. But first, you have to understand the fundamentals behind what you're doing. And then once you understand the fundamentals, then you can move into learning how to code and learning how to apply uh, these these uh, techniques uh, for for solving real time applications, you know. So I always tell people always 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 first learn the fundamentals, understand what you're doing because if you don't learn the fundamentals, it could be dangerous, right? You're gonna go in there um, uh, like blindfold, you know, like blindfolded, and just running different models without knowing what the model is doing, how it's converging. Uh, whether you've reached your local minimum, whether you've, 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 you've reached your optimum solution, you know, applying those, those models without any type of background will be very difficult. So my first recommendation is to learn as much as you can about the fundamentals and then move into coding. And then, you know, the last piece is simply the application of it in Python is a free open source. That, that, that is super easy. You can use Python, you can use R, you can use Julia. There are, there are different type of platforms for those type of applications. So uh, sometimes we get this question. Uh, someone say, hey, I, I have the passion. I want to learn, but I almost know nothing about programming. I know nothing about artificial intelligence. So how long it takes to uh, consider yourself uh, like an expert? Or, you know? Yeah, so the expert honestly comes from years and years of experience. You know, you cannot just learn this. I mean, you can learn the stuff, you know, if you, if you studied for 10, 12 hours a, a day, in six months, you could be up and going, but until you actually apply these techniques to real world problems and solve real world problems, you know, and provide a value proposition, that's when I would call you an expert, you know, then, then you, cause you know, learn, you know, using uh, open source data sets that have been, you know, um, provided to you for that purpose to use for just practices, you know, Anybody can do that, right? But the next step in your mind should be, okay, which areas of my study can I apply this to? Can I apply this to, for example, solving a problem in drilling engineering, in completions engineering, in production engineering, you know? And that's when you have to kind of hone in more on, you know, what is the value proposition of, 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 of actually like applying this uh, to, to, uh, to provide value for the organization, you know? Okay. It seems like we received another question. Someone asking, do, do we need a software for this, uh, uh, course uh, other than Python? Yeah. For, as I said, you can use different softwares like R Python. You can use MATLAB, uh, to, 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 to run your machine learning models. But, you know, you don't need any other softwares besides Python to run this. You can do everything in Python. You don't need to, you're more than welcome to learn different programming languages. I actually encourage that, but you don't need to, uh, you know, uh, we're not going to use two different languages, uh, you know, in, 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 like in this course. We're just going to use, uh, we're just going to get some introduction to Python as far as how you can just do some, run, run some basic code. 
Well, that's a wrap for today. Thank you, Mr. Briade, and thank you all. The lecture will be uploaded uh, to Pi Petro YouTube channel. Don't forget to solve the quiz on Google Classroom. Thank you again, and see you next Saturday.